The Federal High Court in Abuja has ordered former Minister of Petroleum, Desiani Alison Madweke, to appear before it and answer to a money laundering charge filed against her by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. In a ruling on Friday on an ex-party motion, Justice Ijoma Ojuku ordered the issuance of summons on Desiani for her. Uh, for her to attend a court uh, to, for the purpose of her arraignment on the charge uh, to ensure that Desiani was aware of the invitation, Justice Ojuku ordered that the court summons should be published on the website of the EFCC and a national daily in a conspicuous manner. Justice Ojuku adjourned till October 28th this year for Desiani to attend court for the purpose of her arraignment on the pending money laundering charge. We now have Dr. Babatunde Ajibade San, a legal practitioner, joining us via Zoom to take a look at virtual proceedings in court. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. While it is a reality that many sectors are embracing virtual correspondence, the judiciary, especially the bench, appears not ready to move with the trend. Why do you think so? I don't think that the issue is the readiness or willingness of the judiciary. Uh, I, I think the real problem is, is with capacity. Um, I believe that a significant number of our judicial officers uh, are probably technologically challenged. Um, and that is something that we have to acknowledge as a reality and do something about. So it's going to require significant investments in terms of training and retraining uh, for those who have even the basic skills. And then of course, there's um, the need to invest significant amounts in, in infrastructure because technology um, you know, is not just a buzzword. It, it's great when it works, but then it requires significant investments in infrastructure and the backbone uh, to make sure that it works properly, to make sure that you have the right bandwidth for internet access, to make sure that you have the right hardware uh, in, in our courts, to make sure you have the right software that is designed uh, uh, or, or created, purchased off the shelf or custom built uh, for, for judicial processes. So I, I'm not sure that it is just as simple as saying that the judiciary is not ready. Um, I think the judiciary has to be made ready. Uh, and that requires that everybody plays a part. Um, everybody that's a member of the legal profession uh, and everybody that has an interest in a justice sector that works, which means the government, the entire government, uh, must be prepared to play a part, especially by making the necessary investment in making our judiciary um, able to use technology properly. With the Supreme Court dismissing Ekiti and Lagos suits on virtual hearing, what exactly should be done in terms of constitutional amendments to embed it into the Constitution? The decision of the Supreme Court uh, on the applications brought by the Lagos and Ekiti state governments, um, for me, does not uh, necessarily sound uh, a death knell for a judicial answer to the problem of whether or not virtual hearings are constitutional. I still believe that um, a judicial solution is preferable to a constitutional amendment. Uh, I'm personally of the view that the current constitutional provisions are not a hindrance to um, virtual hearings. And I think it sets a bad precedent if every time there is a doubt about the way in which a provision of the constitution may be interpreted if we have to then seek to amend the constitution in order to clarify that doubt. The constitution is supposed to be a living document. It should be interpreted to move along with the times. It's not a document that should be amended you know, every six months, uh, just like any other statute. So personally, I would still prefer that we find another way of getting this question before the Supreme Court as quickly as possible. The Supreme Court has not decided the point. Unfortunately, it declined to decide the point um, when the Akiti and Lagos state governments uh, brought the actions that they brought. Those actions were brought specifically for that purpose, but the Supreme Court um, did not seize the opportunity provided uh, as a policy court to lay down clear, clearly what its policy is on this issue. I mean, the Supreme Court's policy can be inferred from the fact that the Na National Judicial Council, which is the highest body uh, uh, for the judiciary uh, has already 
establish guidelines for virtual hearings. So if the National Judicial Council has set out guidelines for virtual hearings, and if quite a lot of our courts have also issued um, guidelines for virtual hearings, I, I think it is reasonably safe to assume that those courts will, if confronted with the question uh, as to whether virtual hearings are constitutional, would answer it in the affirmative. And uh, lastly, what, what would you say is your take about the independence of the judiciary in Nigeria today? There, there's no doubt that the significant questions around the independence of the Nigerian judiciary at the moment, and this is obviously a generalization. Um, there are individual judges who, by the pronouncements they, they make um, on a daily basis uh, in matters involving the state, um, exhibit significant degrees of independence. Um, so when we say that there are concerns about the independence of the judiciary, it is a, a, a generalization. But that those concerns exist is also not in doubt. Uh, and I think that the fundamental problem has a lot more to do with the nature of the relationship between um, uh, the judiciary uh, and the executive uh, than anything else. I think that our process of appointment our process of promotion, our process of selection uh, of judges has been polluted in such a way that um, our political class and the executive play roles that they are not intended to play in that process. And oftentimes this undermines the independence of our judicial officers ever before they get onto the bench. Um, if you've been appointed a judge um, because of the influence of a politician, or if you've been promoted from a particular position in the judiciary to another position because of the influence of a politician, quite clearly it is impossible in those circumstances for you to uh, convince anybody that you are independent of thought. So for me, independence of the judiciary is more fundamental than some of the things that we talk about, which is financial autonomy, et cetera. Those are clearly um, relevant factors. But I think that a judge who is independent of mind and spirit, um, even in the absence of financial autonomy, would stand his ground and make the executive realize that he or she uh, uh, realizes the power of the office that he or she holds and realizes that the judiciary is a third and a very important arm of government. Baba Tunde Ajibade San would like to say thank you for being a part of this conversation. We hope to speak with you again. Uh, remember to stay safe.